Thank you, Dr. Gazenko, for uh, giving our ground rounds today. Um, so I think most people um, know who you are, but uh, for those who don't, you're a professor of medicine here. You are the medical director of the, uh, the ECMO program, and um, I think also the division chief of anesthesiology critical care. Uh, so thank you so much for giving us an update today on the state of uh, uh, ECLS uh, and ECMO. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for a uh, kind of, uh, introduction and also uh, invitation. I'm very excited to talk to you guys. I feel like, you know, I personally talk with most of you all the time uh, in the variety of clinical scenarios. Uh, but I think it's great that I can give you some updates about what is happening in ECLS ECMA uh, world and uh, how overall use of ECMA is changing fairly quickly. Let me just quickly share my screen. All right, now you should see my slides. So uh, we're going to start from some basic uh, definitions and things and then kind of move forward to some evidence as well as um, hopefully we'll have time to share some of our personal experience in UCLA uh, that many of you actually are part of the ECMO program and care of the with very complex patients. I don't have anything financial to disclose, but every time we talk about ECMO, we need to realize that we're talking about off-use, uh, off-label use of ECMO for cardiorespiratory failure, because still as of right now, FDA approves use of ECMO in adults only up for six hours. And you all know we completely exceed this recommendation um, many, 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 many times. So uh, what is ECMO? ECMO is really simplified closed circuit cardiac pulmonary bypass. You know, in reality, ECMO is actually a fairly simple system, especially in the range of medical devices we have available right now in modern medicine. There are some uh, important components of ECMO that we need to understand and know about. One is oxygenator, and I think this is kind of the heart of ECMO. This is probably the most important component where the gas exchange is happening. And this is where interface of blood and gas uh, takes place. And this is where CO2 is removed and oxygen is placed inside of the blood. Second component is pump. And there is a variety of pumps on market, different models, different manufacturers. But in reality, most of the modern pumps are continuous flow centrifugal pumps. And the one that we use in UCLA most frequently is Metronic Biomedicals or Centrimark pumps. And the third component, or mostly kind of group of components, are cannulas. And this day, there is a variety of different cannulas that we use to connect patient to ECMO. <clears throat> People talk about ECMO uh, and frequently describe ECMO as vena venous or vena arterial. But these days, we realize it's really not about mode of ECMO. It's actually about indications, because indication is really driving everything about care of the patients. It's going to drive decision of what kind of modality and ECMO configuration we're going to use, as well as patient selection, as well as patient outcome, and patient management. <clears throat> so if we think about why we need to put patient on ECMO, it's really about two major groups of indications. One is respiratory failure, and the second is heart failure. And we have about 10 to 15% of the patient who actually present with combined cardiorespiratory failure. When we have patients with respiratory failure, we typically tend to go and use vena venous ECLS or ECMO. And this is really uh, serves as primarily goal of gas exchange. The gas exchange for oxygenation and also decarboxylation of the blood. Typically patients placed uh, on ECMO through two cannulas. One is placed through the femoral vein into IVC that drains blood. And then once blood is de decarboxylated and oxygenated, oxygenated blood returns back to the venous system and uh, essentially highly saturated with oxygen before even reintroduced into the pulmonary circulation. The most important component of venous venous ECMA is functioning heart. If patients have cardiac dysfunction, then venous venous ECMA might not work well. When we have patients with heart failure or combined cardiorespiratory failure, then we typically go with vena arterial ECLS. And with vena arterial ECMA ECLS, the primary goal is not just gas exchange. Actually, most of the time it's not. It's actually much more important about uh, circulatory support 
perfusion of organs. And most of the time uh, we use peripheral vein arterial cannulation as most of you've seen. When we put cannulas through groin vessels from femoral vein, we drain blood same way as here. And we return blood through the arterial cannula that is placed in the femoral artery. Sometimes when patients are most of the time in surgical uh, arena, they might be placed on the central VA ECMO, but this is becoming less and less common. There's also some novel developments and um, many of you probably have seen it, and uh, novel developments and, in terms of cannula. This cannula has been introduced, I would say about eight, nine years ago, and primarily was used actually as right ventricular assist device, percutaneous RVAT. And uh, the brand name was Protect Duo. And the idea of this thing was actually being inserted similar to Swan Gans catheter, drain blood from right atrium and then in inject blood into the pulmonary artery. This way we essentially offloading right vent ventricle and improve right ventricular support. But also you can realize if you put oxygenator here, it's gonna be the, uh, serve as not just RV support, but also as uh, ECMO. We start using this mode of cannulation more and more for patients with severe COVID because many of these patients are presenting not just with respiratory failure, but also with severe RV failure. And there's very interesting results and descriptions uh, in the literature about using it. It's a bit more technically difficult because you need uh, fluoroscopy uh, and cath lab to do that. But there is a lot of interest about this mode of cannulation. And this is what we call right atrium to PA cannulation. As probably many of you know, uh, use of adult ECMO for many years was uh, very little and was quite underutilized, primarily because we did not have good evidence to support it. Pediatric and neonatal ECMO has been around since late 70s, early uh, 80s, but adult was not. And everything has changed somewhere in 2009, 2010 uh, with H1N1 pandemic. It brought a lot of interest back in terms of using ECMO for adults. And you can see essentially exponential growth of both respiratory as well as adult ECMO use uh, in uh, patients all over the world. And this is data from ELSA registry that collects probably about 70 to 80 ECMO runs of entire world. But also one thing you can notice that right before 2020, the use of cardiac, adult cardiac ECMO was actually outpacing respiratory. Things changed a little bit in 2020 with COVID, but use of cardiac ECMO is substantially increased in last decade. So why? Why ECLS became so much more used in heart failure? Well, there is several reasons for that. Probably one of the most important, that mortality of patients with cardiogenic shock remains very high. And I'm sure you know all the data I'm going to show you, but I think it's going to make a nice presentation overall to review it quickly. We know that patients with acute cardiogenic shock, primarily in the settings of acute coronary syndrome, has exceedingly high mortality. Shock 2 trial showed the mortality about 40%, and then culprit shock trial showed mortality even exceeding up to 50%. And this mortality is not changing despite all the advances we have made in uh, ACS management in the last couple of decades. Uh, some of the recent studies that look at SKY uh, classification show that the more advanced shock patient present with, the higher mortality it is. And if you look at the extreme or deteriorating or extremist uh, shock, the mortality exceeds 50% and, and up to 70%. So definitely patients uh, uh, die with advanced heart failure uh, in very large numbers, and that's the need. The second reason that is actually existing mechanical circulatory systems, they have some limitations. Uh, most commonly used is intraortic balloon pump, impeller, and tandem heart, and they provide only partial uh, cardiac support. They are limited only supporting one chamber, most of the time left ventricle, uh, and as well as they have a fair amount of complications. In addition, the evidence to use uh, these devices is not as strong. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with shock to trial that show that there is no benefits of using intraortic balloon pump for patients presenting with cardiogenic shock and ACS. And as a result of that, the use of balloon pump in these particular settings has uh, diminished substantially. 
um, but also we love to use uh, um, micro axial intravascular devices, also known as Impella. We like it, we use it a lot, but also the evidence is still not very strong. This study was published a couple of years ago, looking at uh, um, registry, and they identify patient presenting with cardiogenic shock, uh, with uh, MI going for PCI. And they found from this group of the patients, group of the patients who were presenting with cardiogenic shock, and some patients receive uh, impellers, some patients receive intraortic balloon pump. And then they did a very nice statistic analysis with propensity matching. And what they found was actually patients who receive impellers had worse outcome comparing to patients who receive balloon pumps. Obviously, it's a registry study. It's very hard to con compare one to another, but there is something about it that tells us like the probably the use and evidence to use this device is not as strong as I would like it to be. Another reason why ACLS and ECMO came back and is used more and more because technology is so much better. We have really developed uh, modern technology with minimally invasive placements of cannulas, excellent membranes and pumps, as well as portable system that makes application of ECMA very easy and uh, fairly uncomplicated. In addition, besides the technology, we also learn a lot about how to select patients, how to manage patients, as well as how to prevent potential complications. And that complex of things actually substantially uh, increased our uh, understanding how to manage patients who are supported with ECMA, both respiratory as well as cardiac. So that's why when we talk about VA ECMA for patients with cardiogenic shock, there is major advantages. First of all, ECMA provides biventricular support. And this is essentially the only device on market that can do this uh, amount, this modality. Second, ECMO provides excellent flow and potentially can replace entire cardiac output of the patient. In patients who present with combined cardiorespiratory failure, it provides both circulatory and respiratory support. Placement of ECMO can be done essentially in any settings, cath lab, bedside and ICU, operating room, and uh, trained practitioner can do it fairly quickly and fairly uh, without complications. The price is a difficult question because uh, you can have fairly cheap system that will be much cheaper than Impella or Tandem Heart. However, the price of patient management and ICU stay might actually offset. So, and every time you talk about money in healthcare, it becomes very complicated. So how we see VA ACMA these days in the patients uh, in the heart failure and cardiogenic shock? There is a variety of indications, acute myocardial function, acute and chronic heart failure, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, chronic RV failure in the patient with P, acute RV failure in patients with pulmonary embolism. All of these patients will essentially require some degree of support to survive. In addition, we have patients with VT storms or cardiac arrest. And in these settings, VA ECMO can be used as a bridge. And I think it's very important to understand that VA ECMO doesn't fix anything, right? As frequently we have some degree of different support systems, it only keeps patients alive. And we need to have some kind of exit strategy out of ECMO. Some of the exit strategy most common and hopefully the best is recovery. Sometimes patients will not recover. They will need to have either transplantation or durable mechanical circulatory support. And sometimes it's decision to see if we can actually make patient a candidate for that or transplant if recovery is not an option. There's also one thing that is not on this slide where we start learning more and more is concept of escalation and de-escalation. When patients, for example, come in in cardiogenic shock, and I have one case a little bit later today, and failing medications require, for example, impellent, still failing, and then we kind of escalate to the next level of support is VA ECMA. And once they stabilize and have initial recovery, we can de-escalate back to some temporary VAD and potentially full recovery with no transplant and durable VAD. So this is the concept that is being utilized more and more in modern cardiogenic shock heart failure therapies. And I always like this picture because unfortunately it's um, 
reminds me the clinical scenario sometimes we end up in. We always like when we put patient on ECMO to end up on Golan uh, Gate Bridge to go from city to marine. <clears throat> but at the same time, once in a while, we end up in a situation of bridge to nowhere when patients do not get better, do not recover, and they're not transplant or vet candidates. And that creates substantial uh, ethical dilemma for practitioners and the families. So when we think about bridging somebody with ECMO, there, I, there is always several components. And there's, I would describe three important components of, or pillars of successful ECMO bridging. Number one is the patient selection. And a lot of things in what we do in medicine is really driven by patient selection. And most of the outcomes are uh, determined by that. Second is cannulation. And uh, these days, most of the cannulation is done percutaneously uh, with some imaging guidance. And the third one is post-cannulation management, prevention of complication, as well as de-escalation and liberation from ECMO. All of these things are important, but we don't have enough time to go through all of this stuff. I'm just going to highlight uh, patient selection. So when do we think, what is the general principle uh, when we start thinking about the use of ECMO ECLS for the patient with heart failure? Well, first and foremost, we need to have failure of medical management. If patient is still not optimized with medical management, if they're adequately supported with medications and some less invasive MCS, we should not jump to ECMO. ECMO is really reserved to extreme cases. However, also I have to mention that if we wait too long and patients develop worsening multi-organ failure because of the cardiogenic shock, that's the time that we might actually miss the window. And even with application of ECMO might not uh, salvage the patient. So it's a very fine balance to decide when to do it. But if patient is doing well and stable enough on existing medical management, we should not escalate to ECMO. Also patients should have high likelihood recovery or have good candidacy for VAT on transplant. Otherwise we're gonna end up with bridge to nowhere situation. Absence of multiple comorbidities, irreversible organ damage, and spe specifically neurologic injuries uh, is typically the, one of the requirements. And the life expectancy exceeds the duration of recovery from acute illness. And I think this is a little bit complicated way to say that uh, if we put patient on ECMO, they should survive acute illness. And some other coexisting diseases, even the chronic and life-threatening, uh, might actually uh, not affect patients survival long term. And I think the best example is cancers. You know, like 10, 15 years and 20 years ago, cancer was absolute contraindication for ECMO application. But these days, uh, with modern chemotherapy, many advanced cancers become kind of chronic diseases. And as a result of that, patients will live with stage four prostate and breast cancer for many years. And doesn't mean that we should not put them on ECMA for a short period of time in the settings of acute coronary syndrome or things like that. What are the contraindications? And contraindications are very interesting in the overall, in the use of ECMA because they're very evolving topic. There are some absolute things that frequently mostly technical. Aortic dissection is absolute contraindication. Severe aortic insufficiency, uh, severe peripheral vascular disease are things that will essentially preclude us putting patient on ECMO. Obviously, severe neurologic injury is contraindication because we will not invest significant resources in the patient who has no chance of survival. As well as question about irreversible heart failure in the patient who is not candidate for VETA transplant is always kind of red flag. I cannot say we've never done it. We, we've done situations like that, but typically when we put patient on ECMA with questionable candidates, it's always kind of decision, bridge to decision. Maybe we can actually clarify something and patient will become candidate. There's also a long list of relative contraindication. And I think depending on the programs, on the centers, on the countries, things will vary. Advanced age is contraindication, but obviously, as you know, advanced age is a very relative thing. Uh, extremes of BMI is contraindication. Presence of variety of comorbidities is contraindication. Presence of advanced multi-organ failure is always red flag, but again, I think if it's acute and we think potentially reversible, this become very soft contraindication. Presence of bleeding and coagulopathy is actually not 
strong contraindication. We had patients who had significant bleedings. And because we can use ECMO without anticoagulation, uh, we uh, can do it successfully. It's not very strong contraindication. If you look at data, and again, I'm going to go back to ELSA data. Um, overall, um, use of ECMO has been growing. As you can see, total number of rounds in thousands going up and up and up with every year. But the green line here shows overall survival. Uh, to discharge of ECMA. So we're not just getting uh, excited to put more patients on ECMA, actually our survival is improving. And this is supported by some of the rep reports coming out in the literature and published. This is a report that is uh, based on the big uh, interventional cardiology study, patient presenting with uh, acute coronary syndrome uh, with MI and cardiogenic shock. And you can see they look back at almost 15 years time and they uh, observe increased use of ECMA in patients with an acute MI. And in 15 years, the use of ECMA increased by 11 fold. What was also interesting, it's not just use of ECMA has increased, but similarly, the mortality went from 100% to 45%. And if you think about it, they're looking at pretty old data and in the overall uh, fast developing ECMA uh, evidence and growing evidence, 10 years is a huge time. A lot of things has changed in the last decade. So when we look at the data from before 2000, we really cannot use it to make decisions about uh, application of ECMO these days. Even when you look at early 2000, the use and technology and management of the patient with ECMO has changed so much that uh, and evidence is evolving so fast that even this data doesn't really reflect reality of today data. Uh, this is a little bit more recent evidence and data. This is coming from three uh, big cardiac and cardiac surgical centers, Duke Columbia and Wash U. When they look at their registry uh, of use of ECMA in 2007, 2017, and they had about 700 plus patients in the registry. And most of the patients were post-cardiotomy, kind of heart transplant patients world. And again, this is very busy heart, plant, heart surgical centers, but also some patients with cardiac myopathy and MI. And they describe overall use of ECMA in this population. And they describe 40% survival to discharge. So it's actually not bad because if you think most of the patients were in extreme, but they also describe increased uh, mortality up to 60% in patients who with advanced age, uh, increased BMI and, and in females. They also describe things that we unfortunately face all the time, substantial, significant amount of complications, acute renal dysfunction, bleedings, as well as uh, neurologic deficits. This study was actually published literally, I think one week ago. And this is a very interesting study. Uh, it's a data coming from ELSA registry from 2010, 2020. So very recent data. They took all the patient with adult uh, VA ECMOs uh, and look at patient with cardiogenic shock. And they tried to retrospectively apply SKY classifications and they use, and because SKY is kind of clinical classification and you don't have many, many criteria in the ELSA registry. They use a um, couple things to kind of define the criteria. It was number of pressors as well as number of MCS devices. As based on combination of this um, criteria, they assign B, C, D, or E to the class of patients. And you can see that they had 12,000 patients. That's a lot of patients that were placed on VA ECMA in the last 10 years. And not surprisingly, uh, the higher classific uh, higher class uh, of shock patient wearing, the higher mortality was, with mortality exceeding 60% in patient in E class. What was actually interesting, they found that almost 30% had shock due to post-cardiotomy. And in this group, mortality remained almost the same, irrespective of the amount of support they were on. However, if patients were on medical, as they call, uh, shock. In this group of patients, mortality correlated with um, class of uh, shock by sky classification. Uh, I'm going to quickly show you the case we had here some time ago to kind of describe and show 
uh, what exactly happened with patients who end up on VA ECMO. So we had a 48 year old uh, man who had actually cardiac arrest in the field, got bystander CPR and got ROSC. Comes to the uh, UCLA, goes to cath lab, and uh, they place mid LED stand, multiple defibrillation and impeller place for cardiac support. And patient comes to ICU on very high doses of medical therapy, anatropes, impeller maxed out, essentially in bad cardiogenic shock and mouth perfusion. And this is the time when you say, you know what, we're failing our medical therapy. And this is the time to escalate our care. He was placed on ECMA and uh, hopefully it's gonna work. Yes, it does, great. So this is uh, his echo with impella on ECMA. And you can see that severely diminished left ventricular function. Uh, so once patient is on ECMA, overall shock slowly improving, malperfusion is stabilized. Two days later, we're performing ECMA winning trial. And you can see on this echoes that substantially improve left ventricular function to the point that uh, patient is getting decannulated from both impella and ECMA extubate following day and discharge home eight days later. So obviously great success story, not always goes like that, but this is described excellent example of escalation of care in the settings of severe cardiogenic shock due to acute coronary syndrome. But do we have evidence, good quality evidence to actually do that? Well, we actually don't. We really don't have it, at least for now. However, there's multiple randomized controlled trials ongoing right now, mostly in Europe, that hopefully within the next two to four years should give us more evidence uh, to guide the use of ACMA in patient presenting primarily with acute coronary syndrome and shock. Uh, if uh, Yesterday, I was actually was very curious to... Um, look at our own data and I'm very excited to share it with you guys. So this is our own UCLA data from 2015 to 2022. And the reason I did not go deeper beyond 2015 because at that time we had a little bit less structured ECMA program and the data is not very uh, good quality. So if we think about patients between 2015, 2022, last September 2022, we had 160 patients presenting with cardiogenic shock. I can't tell you exactly the breakdown, but most of these people were either uh, acute coronary syndrome or patients presenting with acute on chronic heart failure. 66% of their males, uh, average age was about 53 years old, and most of them stayed on that one average about five days. Uh, and overall, we had expected recovery. And this is the reason why this patient came off ECMO. So 47% they recover, so it was a bridge to recovery. 12% had VAT, and this is a combination of both durable VAT as well as temporary uh, VAT like Impella. And 6.7% uh, got heart transplant. And 56% actually survived to discharge. And this is actually a very good number because survival to discharge of VECMA average is about 40-45% nationally reported. If we look at subset of patients with post-cardiotomy shock, we had 83 patients with post-cardiotomy shock. And this is the patient typically in operating room who are failing to come off cardiopulmonary bypass after heart surgery. These patients tend to be older. They tend to be sicker. As a result of that, they tend to have more complication and worse outcome. And they we're seeing the same thing. 47% uh, of them survived. 43 actually died on ECMO and only 44% survived to discharge. We can't talk about ECMA for heart failure these days without talking about extracorporeal CPR or eCPR. And this is the very unique scenario when patient is placed on VA ECMA uh, during or right after uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation because uh, typical management and typical ACLS uh, approach is failing. People do it in cath labs in the hospital, and this is a very famous example that usually opens eyes wide for everyone when French group put patients on ECMA in Louvre. So why do we need to think about putting somebody on ECMA during CPR? Well, the reason is because if we don't get patient back really fast, the chance of survival is very low. 
this is fairly old study, but uh, from Reynolds that look at the patients and survivors of the out of hospital cardiac arrest and the time of CPR. And they found that if patient do not get ROSC in 16 minutes of CPR, chance of survival approaches 1%. So we need to get ROSC within first 15 minutes, otherwise patient will die. And at the same time that that study was published, another study was published from Taiwan that look and describe use of eCPR for in-hospital cardiac arrest. It was a very interesting study because it's actually set the stage for all the future development of eCPR for patients with cardiac arrest. Uh, it was prospective study. They enrolled every adult patient in the hospital, and like more than 1,000 bed hospital, twice the size of UCLA, who uh, had CPR for 10 minutes. And then they did propensity matching for a patient who were placed on ECMO versus patient who were not. And what they show that patients who end up on ECMO in these settings had substantially improved survival. In addition, they show the timeline. So if patients get on ECMO within 30 to 45 minutes, survival is still reasonable. Once you go beyond 60 minutes, survival becomes very dismal. Because of all this recent development, we start thinking about the use of cardiac, uh, use of ECMA and kind of timeline of cardiac arrest in several phases. When cardiac arrest starts, this is our time zero. And this is what we uh, uh, think about as the beginning of no flow time. No flow time is between cardiac arrest or patient collapse to the beginning of CPR. And this is probably one of the most important factors in patient survival. And that's why most of the resources uh, AHA actually uh, directing to public education as well as uh, pre-hospital care of the patient with cardiac arrest, because this is where actually most of the um, uh, most of the investment will actually gain better results. Once patients start receiving CPR, this is what we describe as a low flow state, and we're trying to have it as low as possible. And hopefully, within this time patient would have ROSC. If patients do not obtain ROSC and you start getting to 20, 25 minutes, this is the time to start thinking about application of ECLS if you can. And typically, uh, most of the centers who practice ECLS and ECMO for patients with cardiac arrest would say that within the first 60 minutes, this is the timeline to have patient on ECMO, not start cannulation, but actually establish ECMO flow. If you cannot get established ECMO flow within the first 60 minutes of arrest, then most likely survival will be dismal. When we think about use of uh, criteria in UCLA for patients with cardiac arrest, uh, this is kind of our general criteria. Uh, witness cardiac arrest with high quality CPR. Ideally, we're looking at no flow under five minutes, total duration under 60 minutes. And presentation of uh, rhythm is non-asystolic either shockable rhythm or PA. Our internal cutoff is age 75. It's actually very liberal. Many, many, many centers do not put patients under uh, over age of 65 on ECMOS, but we've had good success in carefully selected patients. So if we look at our data, uh, and uh, again, the same time frame, uh, and this is for the patient with in hospital cardiac arrest. We had 90 patients in seven years, seven plus years here. Most of them were male. Average age was 56 years old and median duration of support was about 2.5 days. This is the breakdown where we actually place these patients on ECMO. You can see many of them were in cardiac thoracic ICU. Some of them were actually post-cardiotomy with uh, arrest after cardiac surgery large number of patients in cath lab, in CCU, as well as MICU in the operating room. But this is the patient who had cardiac arrest in the settings of both LV failure, acute coronary syndrome, uh, refractory arrhythmias, massive PEs, uh, pulmonary hypertension crisis. In terms of survival and outcomes, so 47, 44% actually uh, were separated from ECMO successfully because of recovery. 47% died, and we had a number of patients receiving heart transplant, bilateral lung transplant, or VAT, and we had one patient getting actually combined heart-lung transplant. 
overall survival in our experience uh, is about 42 percent of discharge that is actually much higher than, than what is nationally reported national report is like lower 30s but when we talk about ECPR these days, it's really not about in-hospital cardiac arrest. What is really hot and exciting is actually out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And both of these pictures describing application of patient for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And this person is a Dimitri Yiannopoulos from University of Minnesota. And I'm going to go over his studies uh, in the next couple of minutes. He uh, is a big proponent of using ECMO for patient with out of hospital cardiac arrest. This is he's putting patient on ECMO with Lucas in place and cath lab. And this is one of his original studies that completely changed the way that they were delivering care to the patient with out of hospital cardiac arrest in Minnesota. Um, you might know or, or not, but if Paramedics respond to a uh, patient with out of hospital cardiac arrest and they start a standard uh, resuscitation. They're actually not supposed to transfer a patient who doesn't have ROSC from the field. They're supposed to stay in the field, kind of stay and play, and do all the resuscitation measures and typically obtain ROSC and then transfer patient. If they cannot get ROSC within 30 to 45 minutes, depending on different EMS services, states, and things like that, they actually pronounce the patient dead in the field. So what Yiannopoulos initially uh, suggested, he said, we're gonna look at the patient with refractory cardiac arrest who are in shockable VT or VFib, and patients who did not respond to three rounds of CPR, because we know if we can't get them fast out of it then they're going to die. And there is one thing we can offer in the hospital that can be done in the field is ECMO. So they designed the study, essentially all EMS providers who encounter a patient with refractory shockable arrest, uh, instead of staying in the field, would actually get placed on Lucas device to provide uninterrupted chest compressions and be transferred to the hospital, to Minnesota, uh, to University of Minnesota, bypass AD, go directly to cath lab. And the first thing they would do, they would put them on ECMO and then they would do cath. So initial study was 62 patients. And when they compare them outcomes to their historic one, they show survival to discharge was good neurologic outcome, 45% versus 15%. Obviously it was fantastic result. And uh, follow up, they were able to do a randomized control trial that probably you've heard about is a rest trial was published a couple of years ago and it was a randomized trial. They did the same thing, but they actually randomized patients to be uh, placed on ECMO or not. Same protocol, and they show that patients who were placed on ECMO had substantially improved survival uh, versus patients who were not placed on ECMO. But when you look at the study, you quickly realize it's really not about device. It's not about ECMO saving lives. It's really about study of well-established and well-trained multifaceted resuscitation program with very well-rounded pre-hospital system that is integrated with high-level academic center with all resources available. But again, very eye-opening result for a uh, problem that has exceedingly high mortality. At the same time as Yiannopoulos was doing his study in Minnesota, Jan Belakhvalik was doing the same design study in Prague. And the results of the study was published, I believe, uh, earlier this year. Uh, it was a very similar design. So it was a metropolitan area, Prague, and population about 1.2 uh, million. Uh, they look at the only adults who was witnessed out of hospital cardiac arrest. They actually did not select patients with shockable rhythm. And that's why probably some results are a little bit different. And the idea was to randomize patients in the field. If within five minutes they would not get ROSC, patients either were uh, randomized to stay in the field and continue resuscitation, or the same thing, put Lucas on, bring to uh, one a university hospital, go to cath lab, and get placed on ECMO. And they look at overall outcome of 180 day survival. One thing they were looking at is a 10% difference in survival based on the pre-existing data, but they also were looking at survival in the control group in the standard therapy, 10 to 15%. Uh, they screened a lot of patients and uh, overall you can see it was very good kind of randomization. 
interestingly enough, uh, they had a large number of patients with asystole or PA that probably slightly changed their outcome. But look at this thing, bystander CPR was 99%. And this is one of the highest in the world. And they're very proud about uh, public awareness about cardiac arrest and how quickly patients in Prague get CPR if they develop cardiac arrest. So this study actually, primary outcome did not reach statistical significance. They had 31% uh, survival to 180 days in invasive group versus 22% in standard group. But that result is substantially higher than that, what they were expecting. And you can see that actually changing the way that care was provided and maybe some degree of halter effect on standard therapy group. A couple of interesting thing here, uh, both group had a fair amount of sustained risk uh, in both standard therapy as well as invasive therapy. And not every patient who was randomized to ACMA received ACMA. Only 66% of them actually end up on ECMO. Uh, but if you look at this study, and uh, I had a chance to talk to Jan uh, personally, and he said, uh, he liked to say this study was one of the uh, most positive negative studies um, because they saved a lot of patients. 30%, 20 to 30% survival for patients with refractory cardiac arrest is a, it's substantially higher than anything else reported. But this particular study was probably underpowered. Um, and, you know, they had better survival in the control group. They also had some degree of improvements in secondary outcomes, like survival to 30 days was good neurologic impairment. But uh, this study, again, confirms that this technology, primarily in the settings of well-designed um, healthcare uh, system, can work quite well. So... What is our experience? We have been doing uh, eCPR for patient with out of hospital arrest for quite some time, uh, but more systematically, more in 2017, 2018. And this is the patient that are placed in uh, ED, typically trauma bay on ECMA, who presents with refractory cardiac arrest or patient who present with cardiac arrest from the field, had ROSC and then arrest again. We had 50 patients. Uh, with kind of median age, mostly male, uh, median age of 54%, uh, 54 uh, years old. Uh, we had uh, almost 45% came off ECMA because of recovery of the heart and 51% died on ECMA. Uh, overall survival to discharge was about 42%. And again, I don't have detailed granular data on that, but most of these patients were discharged with CPC1, CPC2. Uh, as results of this uh, initiative from Minnesota and Prague, we actually uh, became part of LA County uh, study to look if we can replicate the same kind of approach to the patients, but not based on one single center and one uh, uh, EMS service, but coordinate something on a much larger scale. So we partnered with Cedar sinai uh, LA County Hospital, as well as uh, LA County Fire Department, LA City Fire Department, and Beverly Hills, Color City, and Santa Monica Department, with the idea to essentially replicate uh, Minnesota and Prague protocol, but on a much larger scale. Uh, we right now running the study, and many of you who respond to STEMI codes uh, in ED actually see these patients. Uh, we look at the adult patients who are in refractory shockable rhythm, who are failed uh, resuscitation for three shocks. We exclude typical patients, but also we use uh, some of the criteria that clinical team might decide that uh, something is uh, suspicious about presentation of the patient. Patient will not be a good candidate for survival. Uh, one important thing about this particular study, that if patient is qualifying for uh, to be enrolled in the study, paramedics will actually bypass closest uh, STEM receiving center and go to ECMO center. And this is really changing the way that uh, care to the patients is provided. And the reason is because even if they go to STEMI center without, if they remain in the refractory cardiac arrest, the chance of survival is close to zero. Uh, this is the protocol, and I apologize, probably fine print, but again, it's outlined if patient's potential ECMO candidate, criteria, so they deliver first round of defibrillation, 
then they uh, repeat the second one. And with the third one, they should be kind of packing and ready to transfer to the uh, ECMO receiving center. So idea was that we're gonna enroll 40 patients and the primary outcome is hospital survival CPC1, CPC2. Comparison group, uh, we're looking at control identified from EMS database. Essentially every one patient who had STEM with similar presentation but did not go to ECMO center. Uh, this is kind of a map of how it happens in UCLA. Uh, once we have information that patient is coming, our emergency uh, department activate ECMO and cath lab teams. Uh, patient arrives with Lucas on uh, and ongoing typical ACLS resuscitation. Uh, ECMO team together with uh, emergency medicine and cardiology quickly assess the patient and decide if patient is a good candidate. If it's an witness arrest, if uh, duration of CPR longer than 60 minutes, if patient is asystole, have low and tidal CO2 or low PAO2. Those are kind of signs of poor resuscitation. Those are red flags and will exclude patient from initiation. Once patient goes on ECMO, we stabilize patient. Typically patient goes to cath lab. And this is the case with one of those patients. So we had 61 year old male, suffer witness cardiac arrest, no flow time was under five minutes. Uh, EMS found him in shockable rhythm. Uh, they did five rounds of defibrillation. Again, not really by protocols. They stay in the field a little bit too long, but they get no ROSC. Uh, they put him on Lucas and they get him to ED within 35 minutes. So it's actually, despite staying in the field longer, uh, they were able to get patient pretty quickly because it was close to UCLA. Uh, patient goes on ECMO, typically within 10, 15 minutes from arrival, patient is on ECMO and goes to cath lab and found to have uh, uh, LED occlusion uh, and has stands place here. So you can see cath without before intervention and now after intervention. Uh, fortunately, and it's always probably the most important thing we wanna know after we stabilize the patient is more exam. Patient wakes up, but doesn't actually follow right side of his body. Uh, initial CT scan suggests some changes uh, in the brain, most, mostly internal uh, capsule and, and basal ganglia. But patient stays on ECMO for five days, initial EF is 10 to 15%. And you can see the kind of trend of lactate uh, that quickly go down on uh, support as well as peak drop point was 625. Uh, five days later, patient is degenerated of ECMO, extubated, all the drips are went off and 20 days later transferred to neuro rehab. We got MRI and as, as was suspected, had some degree of ischemic stroke, probably PDRS, but actually patient did it really well and long-term follow-up showed substantial improvement in neurologic recovery, as well as cardiac recovery. And you can see echoes here with substantially improved cardiac function. Um, again, as I mentioned, I, I think I talked about this before. Uh, so. I'm gonna share with you, and I don't think anyone knows about this data, but we're about to submit uh, the results of this particular three center, five EMS provider study of uh, LA, uh, greater LA area. So we initiated our protocol in July, 2020. And if you think about it, this was the worst time <laughs> to start something like that because of COVID. We had multiple interruption in every base um, because of COVID. Substantial amount of time went to actually education of pre-hospital providers, EMS education, coordination of EMS and hospital communications, as well as actually obtaining Lucas devices because they are not standard on uh, uh, typical EMS fleet. Uh, we develop this very simple uh, checkpoints for radio report. Uh, when they call into the base. Uh, they also develop these cool stickers to remind paramedics to think about ECMA if they have patient in cardiac arrest. So, and these are our results, uh, very small results, very preliminary and uh, still something to be excited about. We had 35 patients met criteria between three centers. Uh, and uh, on arrival, 11 of them actually went on ECMO, 24 did not go on ECMO. And the reason for 24 patients not going on ECMO because two has uh, ROSC uh, on arrival and the rest had multiple contraindication that although patient 
met the criteria on arrival, clinical teams felt that either presentation was wrong, recitation was not adequate, and uh, felt the patient will not do well with ECMO. 11 patients were placed on ECMO, and survival to discharge was uh, 27%. Yes, it's only three patients out of 11, but 27% is substantially higher than anything else you can think about with a patient with a refractory cardiac arrest. Um, interestingly, uh, this kind of timeline of presentation from ED, uh, ED arrival to ECMO timing is pretty quick, typically uh, 16 to 15 minutes, but in UCLA, typical time 10, 15. But one thing that we need to pay attention, median time from cardiac arrest to ECMO initiation is 76. And it, I think it kind of, uh, shows the overall complexity of this uh, approach. And I think most, it, it's a very promising approach to, to use. It's very resource intense. However, with more education, with more coordination, these numbers can be much better. And I'm sure that once we educate our pre-hospital providers better and uh, improve all the pre-hospital care, the survival of our patient will go up and we can actually replicate results of both uh, Minnesota as well as Prague. Uh, I always show this slide because, you know, ECMO is not about machine. Um, although machine is pretty cool, it's really about people behind the machine. And these days, the complexity of ECMO requires a, a really fantastic multidisciplinary team that we have in UCLA here. Uh, and also I wanna uh, use this opportunity to announce that in January of 2023, end of January, January 28th, we will have our first inaugural ECMO symposium here in UCLA. And it's gonna be a whole day symposium in person as well as we're gonna have uh, uh, online uh, opportunity for people to join our internet. And uh, it's gonna cover essentially all the use of ECMO that are modern, both adult pediatric, respiratory and cardiac. And I'm very excited to say that with, uh, Dr. Bartlett, who is considered founder of ECMO and you know, godfather of ECMO, will actually come and give keynote not stock. So uh, mark your calendars, let everyone know. I think it's gonna be really exciting opportunity to learn for everyone about ECMO. And I will stop here and, and wanna have you take a couple of minutes for questions. Hi, Dr. Gutsenko. This is Sean, uh, the medical student on the SICU team. I was just Hi, wondering if you could, uh, if you could give us a little bit of information about um, when, what, what you consider when you're uh, looking to discontinue the ECMO. Like uh, you talked about the contraindications to starting it, but what, what, what are the factors that you consider when you're looking to uh, pro progress the patient? Oh yeah, Sean, it's it's a great question, and I think. Uh it's i mean it's a separate topic about liberation of from ECMA and uh decannulation uh, you know i think the first criteria when we look at and uh, is uh where we're going right that is a bridging to what and i think most of the time default is recovery so we're assessing patients for recovery of cardiac function typically we use echo surveillance uh, invasive devices uh, like swan gans catheter to look at the resolution of cardiogenic shock, as well as we can easily test patients' hemodynamics by decreasing ECMO support. And we see if a uh, uh, patient can tolerate uh, decreased amount of ECMO and uh, cardiac function is uh, essentially adequate. If we don't have recovery of the heart and we typically give enough time for recovery, and you know, usually it's about five, seven days, then we start thinking about next steps. Is it patient transplant candidate candidate for uh, temporary uh, VAT or durable VAT? In patient with uh, cardiogenic shock, uh, I'm sorry, with cardiac arrest, uh, there is always concern for neurologic injury. And actually, majority of the patients who die uh, after cardiac arrest on ECMO die because of the anoxic brain injury. In these patients, uh, prognostication of uh, overall recovery, neural recovery, uh, usually takes place between day three and day five of support. We know that trying to prognosticate uh, 
anoxic brain injury before that is very difficult. So typically we wait about 72 hours of sedation, obviously, and then start looking into neurologic recovery. And if we don't see neurologic recovery and there is substantial evidence of severe anoxic brain injury, then we typically withdraw support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, if no one has any more questions, um, but something comes up later on, I'm more than happy to respond to emails or just if you see me in the hallway, grab me, I'm more than happy to talk about ECMO more. Again, thank you so much for inviting and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Dr. Gazingo, that was an excellent talk. Thank you so much.